Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel where today we're going to be setting up the Battle of Cool Spring from GMT Games' Death Valley Battles for the Shenandoah, the expansion pack. So what I want to do with this one, this video, is going to be a little bit different. I want to, before I set anything up, I want to go through um, kind of like a tutorial or a backgrounder for someone who maybe is not as familiar with how the Civil War um, order of battle looks or works because I find that if you don't understand that then playing this game is going to be very difficult and when you look at the setup chart for a, a scenario um, for example here is Cold Springs setup instructions you're going to look at this and it's not going to mean a whole heck of a lot to you so I want to take a quick minute to explain Civil War Chain of Command, or at least I just should say, especially this is a late war battle, so this is more models, the late war chain of command. Early war chain of command is a little bit different, but for the most part, it's generally the same. So for first we'll start with the Confederates because they're a little bit easier. Okay, so here we have the Confederate Order of Battle for the Battle of Cold Springs. So in, um, in Great Battles of the American Civil War, usually there's an overall commander who is a corps commander. In this case, overall command is Breckenridge. Now, it's, it's um, kind of one way to think about it is you're on top of Breckenridge in the chain of command, you're giving him orders, and he's disseminating it down from there. Now, some battles will have an army commander above the corps commander for the especially big battles, and he'll have four stars here, but Breckenridge is a corps commander, and he's he has three stars. His um, corps, in this case, is the Army of the Valley, represented by AV. He has a command range of 8, that's the number in the black circle. And he has an efficiency rating of 1, which will affect how many orders he gets to send down his chain of command. Now, Breckenridge doesn't activate with any activation markers. So you won't see an activation marker that says Breckenridge on it. Um, but what does matter is in order for his division commanders, which in this case are Wharton, Rhodes, and the and um, King, in order for them to get a change of orders in the division change um, orders segment, they need to trace the chain of command back to Breckenridge. Or technically, Breckenridge has to go down eight within eight hexes to the divisional commanders. So let's go with the infantry first because the artillery is kind of unique. So in this case, we have Breckenridge has two division commanders, Wharton and Rhodes. Wharton commands the 4th Division of the Army of the Valley, and Rhodes com commands the 3rd Division of the Army of the Valley. That's 48-AV, 3-AV. So the division commander, his numbers are his one is the brigade coordination the number is the brigade coordination number that's the die roll modifier for whether he can coordinate all of his brigades into one attack so the higher the number the more likelihood that he's able to um, make more than one brigade activate at one time because usually a brigade activates one at a time or a brigade in a division activates one at a time. So in a normal activation, when we activate Wharton's division, Smith's brigade would activate, do all of its actions, and complete. Then Patton would activate, then Forsberg would activate. But when you change a brigade, when you make a brigade coordination attempt, you use the divisional commander's brigade coordination die roll modifier to see if you can't make more than one brigade act in concert. This is important when you try to make some grand assaults or maybe like a really dashing flanking movement or something. Command range and what's called the activation rating. 
and that really affects how well um, these division commanders are um, self kind of self starters. So a plus one means he gets an extra activation on top of whatever the the efficiency activation the Confederate player draws as long or not as long, regardless of his um, chain of command to Breckenridge. So Rhodes is able to act a little bit more independently than Wharton is. The division commanders are denoted by two stars, and these are the main um, units, so to speak, that are going to be activated in these battles. And um, So that's why you're going to see Wharton AMs and Rhodes AMs. Now, each division has under him brigades. So with Wharton's division, he has three brigades. The first, the third, and the fourth brigades. Under So these brigades um, also need to trace a chain of command back to Wharton. And they need to trace a chain of command to their respective regiments because the counters with actual men on them or artillery on them, but well, I should say the counters with actual soldiers in them are regiments for the most part. Sometimes there's battalions like the 26th Virginia Battalion, um, and sometimes there's sharpshooter units like the 30th Virginia Sharpshooters, but for the most part, the actual counters that are going to be moving around the battlefield and shooting are regiments. And so each brigade has usually between three and five, sometimes more, um, regiments in his command. Um, so for the brigade commander, you have um, a, a letter here. It's going to be an N, a C, or an A, and that is his action profile. So an N means neutral, um, and an A means aggressive, which confers some die roll modifiers, especially in shock combat, and C means cautious. That comes in hand, or that comes into play when you're trying to change the orders of a brigade, because you change the 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 unit that is given orders in this game is the brigade. So the overall commander. Theoretically, you gives orders through Breckenridge to a division commander who then attempts to change the orders between advance, attack, and march, each brigade as they're activated. So, um, and you can see on the actual counters of the regiments, it has the full explanation or the full delineation of, if I can get it into focus, there you go, his chain of command. So he's in the first brigade of the, or sorry, the first brigade of the fourth division of the Army of the Valley. And um, Great Battles of American Civil War also color codes everything. So you'll see that Wharton's division has a red banner at the top. So all three brigades and all the regiments in those brigades have a red banner. While the cohesion rating is the colored box on each regiment, and those colors correspond to the brigade leader's counter. So you see Smith is yellow, and all the regiments in his command have yellow cohesion boxes. Patton is this pink color. All three regiments, well, one regiment and two battalions, have that pink color around their cohesion. And Forsberg is this sky blue color. All three of his regiments have that sky blue color around their cohesion. So that's how you... Same thing with Rhodes. Rhodes has a gray banner, and all the brigades under Rhodes and all the regiments under Rhodes have gray banners uh, around the name. And same thing with the brigades. Now, the brigade can be the same. There's going to be a reuse of colors for the brigades. So you can see Pickens has a yellow um, banner, and his regiments have yellow on their cohesion, and so does Smith and his brigades. But we know that they're different brigades because they have different banner slash divisional colors. So in the sequence of play, in the order segment, when you determine the chain of command, you have to start basically from the top.
Breckenridge has eight movement or eight leader movement points to trace the chain of command to his two division commanders. Those two division commanders have their respective uh, chain of command distance, so both have five. Have to use leader movement to trace chain of commands to each of their brigade commanders. Now, each of those brigade commanders have a chain of command number th three for all of Wharton's brigade commanders. Uh, Pickens has, and then four actually for all of Rose's brigade commanders. So they have a commander uh, range that they have to trace to all their regiments. Now any regiment that's out of the command radius of their brigade is out of command. Same thing for any brigade out of the command radius of its division commander. And any division commander that's who is out of command radius of his core commander. Now, if this is kind of and and one the one in the weeds rule I'm going to give you, say um, Smith is stacked with the 68th North Carolina, who is next to um, the 36th Virginia, who is next to the 45th Virginia Battalion. And um, the 60th Virginia is up there. Um, so say Smith is back here, actually. So this is more than th the 60th Virginia is more than three command movement points from Smith. But since his whole brigade is in line and adjacent to each other, as long as one unit of his of that chain is in chain of command with Smith, the whole brigade is within chain of command of Smith. So even though the 60th Virginia is out of technically the number command range of Smith, because Smith is within command range of the 69th North Carolina, the 36th Virginia, and the 45th Virginia Battalion, because 6th Virginia is adjacent to the 45th Virginia Battalion, he is within command range. So now that you've determined the chain of command, when you do your activation efficiency determination, each core We'll get a um, we'll get an efficiency marker pulled at random based on the scenario rule. So let's say Breckenridge got a, a efficiency of one. That is adjusted by one because of his rating of one. So we're up to two. Now assume that each of his division commanders are within chain of command of him. Um, his division commanders now look at their efficiency rating. So Warren does not adjust that at all. Rhodes adjusts that by another plus one. So if Rhodes is in command range of Breckenridge, it goes one plus one plus one. So Rhodes' division will get three AMs put into the cup this turn. Meanwhile, Wharton will get 1 plus 1 plus 0, so he would get 2 AMs put in the cup this turn. Artillery is always difficult, or it's always a little uh, persnickety. And usually you have to look at the battle book to tell you where, how artillery activates and where it chases, traces its chain of command to. So you'll look in the Cool Spring battle book or the battle book entry for uh, Cool Spring. It tells you that the Confederate Artillery Battalion is commanded by an artillery leader, Lieutenant Colonel J. Floyd Knight, or King. When unassigned, the artillery battalion activates with three artillery AMs. The artillery battalion may be assigned to a division, in which case King traces a chain of command to the division leader and activates with its division AMs. And then it says no artillery can be assigned to brigades. And artillery assigned to a division activates as a separate brigade. So let's break that down. So usually when um, this scenario starts, Breckenridge will put, you'll, you'll draw an efficiency marker, you'll modify it by Breckenridge, and he'll send it down to his division commanders. So what that means is when the scenario starts, no matter what, King will be activating with all three of these artillery AMs as long as he is in um, chain of command to Breckenridge. And as long as all of his 
um, batteries are within three hexes of himself. Now, in the division orders change segment, uh, the Confederate player could attach King to either Rhodes or Wharton's division, and if he does so, they could um, activate with Rhodes or Wharton's AMs instead of these artillery AMs, and in which case um, it will activate as if it was another brigade, so it would activate on its own complete before another brigade activated and completed. And so that's the Confederate side of the battle. Now let's look at um, the Union order of battle for the Battle of Cool Spring. So again, you're the overall commander. Wright is the commander of Six Corps. Now this is confusing because under him is another corps commander. Well, technically he's an army commander. We have Crook, who is in command of the Army of Western Virginia. And then under Crook, there's one division. So we have AWV for Crook's army slash corps and in, in, in essence it operates as a corps but under him he has one division in this battle thornton's who is the first division of the army of western virginia and you can see by his two stars now under thornton uh, sorry thoborn are three brigades wells eli and frost and eli's is pretty chunky but again you can see that it all has the pink cohesion boxes that trace back to Eli's second brigade of the first division of the Army of Western Virginia. So when Thoburn's activation marker is drawn from the cup, Wells, Eli, and Frost all activate. Now what about the artillery? Now the artillery is again a confusing aspect. So this is just a, a, a kind of anom an anomaly of the Union late war command structure. So Wright is a corps commander. The only thing he technically commands in this battle is the six corps artillery, Tompkins. And so when Tompkins activates, he has to trace the chain of command to Wright. So these two batteries have to trace the chain of command to Tompkins, who traces the chain of command to Wright. And they're the only units in this battle who will be chasing, tracing a chain of command to Wright because Cook acts independently of Wright. And so all of the infantry has to chase the chain of command to Crook. Now there's a alternative ahistorical scenario where you get Ricketts' division from 6th Corps coming into the battle and he would trace a chain of command to Wright. But as it stands in the historical scenario, all the infantry chase of command to Crook. As you'll see by the battle book, the Army of Western Virginia Artillery Battery does not have an artillery leader, so you don't you see it's just this one battery. And it chases a chain of command to Crook, as seen by AWV on its counter. The Union artillery activates with three artillery AMs when in command. Correct artillery may be assigned to divisions just like the um, Confederates, in which case it activates with the division AMs. So in that sense, it's the same as the Confederate artillery. Okay, and a last note about artillery that will help you set up the game. So you'll see that artillery usually has, well, in the Confederate case, a name like Lewisburg and then a small letter. So Lewisburg A, B, and C. So what this game system does is it breaks down um, artillery um, batteries by section. So we have section A, section B, and section C, and usually each section will have a different type of artillery piece assigned to it. So section A has 10 pound parrots, section B has 12 pound howitzers, and section C has smooth bores. And so for all intents and purposes, these three units, these three counters can be considered one unit. They move around together. Um, they, how they receive hits um, is, without getting too into it, um, basically they're, it, it's one unit 
but it just gets broken down so the artillery piece modifiers can be seen more clearly. So when the setup instructions, for example, say King's AV Artillery, the Lewisburg Monroe and Wise Legion, it's saying every section of those batteries goes in that hex. So when it says Lewisburg, all three sections in that battery go together in a stack. Every Both sections in the Monroe battery and then the Wise Legion only has one battery. Has I think it's 12 pound Napoleons. So that kind of will help you when you see in the setup um, that and then same thing with the Confederate or sorry the Union artillery. So in this case we have um, G battery of the first Rhode Island artillery and C battery of the first Rhode Island and sometimes um, you'll see the little A, B, and C and it'll be broken down by section if the battery has different um, cannon types assigned to it. But in this case, all four cannons and battery G are, um, I think that's a three inch rifle. And all six cannons and battery C are 10 pound parrots. So you'll see on the Cool Spring setup sheet that there is no Confederate setup. So basically what that means is that the Confederates are coming onto the board as the scenario starts. So the Union have already taken up positions on the east side of the Shenandoah River and the Confederates are somewhere off map at this point up here for the 1500 hours turn. So the Union in this scenario, just like the historical scenario, have time to cross the river and take up positions behind the stone wall on the um, left bank of the river. So we only have to look at the Confederate setup because for the, or sorry, we only have to look at the Union setup because the Confederate setup is just reinforcements. So you take Breckenridge's counter, Wharton's counter, Smith's counter, and all of these regiments and put them in the 1600 hours turn on, on the um, sheet on the uh, Battle of Cool Spring turn track. And you do that for all the brigades. Remember, bold means it's going to be a leader counter, and it tells you his chain of command. So then you're looking for all. 1st Brigade, 4th Division, Army of Virginia regiments. And um, if sometimes it'll say reverse or something, that just means it's a replacement leader. So, for example, we have Wells, and on his replacement side is marked by an R in the middle of the star is Washburn. And so what happens is, if a leader takes a casualty, you flip him and the replacement leader takes command and usually that's like the colonel of the brigade or something, or the colonel of the lead brigade, sorry, and usually that's the colonel of the lead regiment, um, but it depends on the brigade and the historical circumstances. Um, same thing with the division leaders, so you'll see if Thoburn is killed, you flip it to the replacement leader, which is Wells. And now Wells is both the corps commander and the command, or sorry, the division commander and the commander of his brigade. So you don't flip this now as well. He stays commander of his brigade, but he's now also the division commander. So to set up the Battle of Cool Springs, you, it's just like any other war game where you take the map hex and then you find the 34th Massachusetts, which is an actual, this will be an actual counter. And then in parentheses, it will tell you the um, chain of command for the 34th Massachusetts. So it will be the 1st Brigade of the 1st Division, Army of Western Virginia. So you go, if you have it laid out like this, you go the Army of Western Virginia, 1st Division, 1st Brigade, here we go, 34th Massachusetts. And he goes in 1511. So he goes there. And then you just go down the setup sheet. So Wells will be bolded, right? Crook and Thoburn will also be bolded, so they're leaders. And usually brigade commanders will be stacked with some leader or some regiment from their command. So in this case, Wells is stacked with the 116th Ohio and together they go in 1514. So here. And with the fifth or 
uh, yeah, the 5th New York Heavy Artillery goes to 1513. And you can see that Wells' brigade is kind of going towards um, these forts to get across the river. And so to finish up setup, uh, 123rd Ohio in 1516. and 170th Ohio in 1614. So you see they came down the Snickers Gap Road, kind of made a hairpin turn, and are going along the right bank of the Shenandoah River to cross the river. Now, the only other thing you have to do is put Wright, Crook, and Thoburn. They're having a little conference in 1617. So Wright, Crook, and Thoburn are in 1617, so they're on this little hill here conferring about what to do. Thoburn is saying they need to bring up six corps to reinforce us, and Wright is saying, no, no, go across the river. And then Battery E, the 1st West Virginia Artillery from the Army of Western Virginia, is here. So he gets put in 1716. And that is on the road here. So I think historically they set up their batteries on this little hill here. And because there's um, three contour lines, they'd be able to shoot over this these trees onto this hill over here. Um, but there, there'd be a modifier for shooting over the trees. Anyway, that's all beyond the scope of this um, walkthrough. Now, you have some notes. So Thoburn has 3 a.m.s for the 1500 hours turn, which means we don't have to draw for efficiency for the 1500 hours turn. The Confederates don't get to draw because they don't get any, there's no Confederate units either on the board or coming in at the 1500 hours turn. It is just Thoburn and his brigades. So Wells is already on the map for the 1500 hours turn, but you'll see that Union reinforcements include all of these guys, basically all of this, coming in as reinforcements. So they are going to activate with the 3 a.m.s that this scenario gives um, Thoburn for the 1500 hour turn. And so there's nothing you need to do with drawing efficiency. You just get to play basically three turn, three activations in a row for Thoburn without really the Confederates doing anything. And that allows you to get across the river, prepare your defenses as best as you can because the rebels are gonna be coming down off this hill in the next hour. And so you also see that the Union Brigades do not accrue fatigue for the third activation, 1500 hours turn, again, to get you to where you need to be. And Wright and the Union Artillery may not cross the Shenandoah River. And you'll see a no note under here that Frost is under Thoburn's command. So you might have been wondering earlier on why Frost had a different banner on his counters to Thoburn, who is this peach or something skin tone color banner and that's because he's in the second division of the army of western virginia so you'll see he is a 3-2 awv but for the purposes of this scenario he is under thoburn's command so you don't have to worry about the fact that he doesn't have a chain of command to the commander of the second division of the army of western virginia so all you have to do now is stack up what's left and put them kind of where, since they're coming in this turn, you don't need to put them on the turn record track. You can just put them off map, but next to the hex that they come in on. And of course, I cut it off, but down here, there is a star on the map, which indicates where the Union reinforcements come in. So they come in on the Snickers Gap Road. So you can just put Eli and his huge stack of brigade and Frost, as well as Tompkins and the Six Corps artillery down off the map just um, on the Snickers Gap Road. And then when you start activating, you can bring in those units from off map. And now there's a um, special rule for Six Corps Artillery, since they're going to be activating with their three AMs, 
um, independent of Thoburn, it says, for the 15 other hour turn, the Union player may elect to defer entry of Tompkins artillery until the end of the activation segment to avoid congestion with friendly units. Union artillery AMs are withheld from the AM pool and played after all other AMs are drawn. So you can get Thoburn's infantry in before you have to bring in Tompkins, and that will allow you to get your infantry where it needs to go without some artillery just hogging up the road, which is a... Um, pretty convenient um, special rule. So here we are. This is the start then of the cool spring scenario. Um, I'll probably be getting to this in the fu near future, um, but hopefully I kind of touched on at least some of the high level aspects of Civil War command structure that will give you a better idea of how um, things work in the game and will Kind of, once you kind of understand that, the activation system becomes much more intuitive and in how you're sending commands down the chain of command and how your efficiency affects how many activations each brigade receives. Because the brigade is the core unit of what you're actually going to be moving on the um, battlefield. You have because you'll activate a brigade and then all of his regiments will be able to activate and then you'll be able to actually finally start moving pieces along the battlefield. But it's not until those orders and those efficiencies get pushed down the chain of command that you can figure out how these guys actually start moving. So hopefully that helped a little bit and hopefully it didn't muddle the um, matter even more. Um, I'm sure some eagle-eyed viewers out there will correct me if I misspoke. You know how it is. As soon as you turn the camera on, all of a sudden you get about 20 times dumber and you just say things that are just wrong. So um, hopefully I'll catch them in the editing process, but if I don't, then please speak up and comment down below to help everybody learn this completely awesome system. Um, but until next time, take care and bye for now.